want to wish you a great uh, Lord's Day morning as we um, gather together, not only for worship, uh, but around the Word as well. And uh, today we're going to uh, move back uh, to our study in Ephesians, and we'll be looking at uh, uh, Ephesians 1, 15 to 23, and I'd like to go ahead and read it uh, to you as we begin. For this reason, and Paul is speaking, I too, having heard of the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, and do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, and not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his, and he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I want to begin with a little bit of a story that took place uh, really a number of decades ago, but uh, it's a personal story. And uh, my dear wife is uh, right here as well, listening to it because she was part of it. But uh, let me begin with a question. Have you ever struggled uh, getting caught up in doing that which is good to the neglect of that which is best? Uh, there was an episode, again, a while back that uh, certainly is vividly uh, etched in my own mind. And that is our garbage disposal, which was uh, underneath the kitchen sink, was broken and it needed to be replaced. And I went out and uh, purchased a new one, brought it home and put it in on my workbench in the garage for two weeks. Uh, with the promise that I would uh, get to it as soon as I possibly could. Well, the big day finally came, and Suzanne left uh, somewhat early with a number of things that uh, she needed to do and errands needed to run, and perhaps a few friends, as I remember it, that she was going to see and wouldn't be back until late afternoon. And that she assumed that I would be under the kitchen sink for a good part of the morning. I got up early and uh, was anxious to get going and I walked in the kitchen and uh, we had entertained the night before and uh, the dishes were still out and nobody had bothered to clean up and there was no way I could work in such chaotic conditions so I made sure that the kitchen got all clean. And uh, that took the first unit of time and then I went out to the garage uh, to get my tools only to notice that uh, my smaller boys at that particular time had been playing in there using my tools and they were scattered all over the place. And uh, they were doing some sort of a project that created a mess as well. And so I paused for a moment <clears throat> and I cleaned up the tools and I cleaned up the rest of the garage and boy was it ever looking great. And then uh, after I finished uh, working in the garage, I just noticed in the driveway that our, our car was just totally filthy. And uh, of course, there's no way I wanted to park that dirty car into our garage. And so I, I washed the car. And uh, finally, I got into tools and brought them into the house and I uh, was looking through and uh, trying to figure out what uh, needed to be done and I realized that I didn't have any plumber's putty and I didn't have any Teflon tape, which were both necessary. So, of course, I jumped in the car and I went down to um, the hardware store and picked up uh, what I needed for the garbage disposal, plus a few things that I knew that I would need 
in the future. And uh, came back home and uh, decided that it was time to, to do it. So I got the, the, the uh, tools together, but I realized that um, it was late in the afternoon and Suzanne was home. And she asked me how the uh, project itself went. And I said, well, I didn't exactly fit, uh, fix the garbage disposal, but I, I did clean out the garage and uh, clean up the kitchen a little bit as well as wash the car. And uh, she was not all that impressed. She felt that I had done the good to the neglect of that which is the best. You know, I, I uh, understand uh, this well, and uh, I have a feeling, I, I wish I could see all of you with um, the wife sitting there listening to this, and uh, because I think it's a male trait, and uh, she's smiling with her arms folded, and uh, by the way, men, when her arms are folded, it's just the cocked position for an elbow to the grip, to the ribs, so just understand uh, that um, uh, I did eventually get it fixed, so that was a good thing. But let me make the spiritual transfer. Uh, the subject that we're looking at today is the subject of prayer. And this is the first of two very remarkable prayers that Paul writes in his letter to Ephesus. And again, Ephesus is there in Turkey uh, on uh, Asia Minor back then, uh, right on the, the west coast there. One of the things about prayer is that uh, prayer is easy to neglect, but we do it to our detriment. You know, Satan, I believe, it doesn't really mind if we get up and go to church so long as we do not pray. Uh, because our being may fill up with all kinds of spiritual knowledge, but it's through prayer that the Spirit of God is able to activate that knowledge into our character. Satan also doesn't mind that we uh, don't get involved in ministry, that we, he's not, doesn't mind that we're in, involved in ministry, uh, so long as we don't pray. You see, it's only prayer that will uncloud our minds enough to um, be able to lift up the Lord rather than ourselves in any particular ministry. You know, in the first part of uh, chapter one, the Apostle Paul, as we uh, perhaps remember this, uh, was running through a litany of blessings. There was election and adoption and redemption and forgiveness and justification. And what Paul is doing in this prayer is that he is praying that our knowledge of all of these blessings will drop that 18 inches from our head to our heart so that they'll be activated in our lives. And so we're going to begin with the occasion of this prayer. And uh, again, I wanna read a few verses that I read a few minutes ago. But Paul says, for this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, I do not cease giving thanks for you in my prayers. And Paul launches into this prayer for the saints in Ephesus because of, of two spiritual components that describe them. First, he hears of their incredible faith in God. And second, he hears that their faith is demonstrated in God by their love for one another. You see, faith in Christ and a sincere love for one another is uh, they're organically linked. A sincere love is a love that's neither cowardly nor brutal. It'll risk the relationship by telling a friend what they need to hear. But they'll do it with tact, they'll do it with tenderness, so to avoid injury. And then Paul continues, he says, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Now it's here that the Apostle Paul puts his finger squarely on the goal of the Christian life. And the goal of the Christian life 
is to know God. And to know God is to love God. And to love God is to become increasingly aware of his greatness, both in the world and in your life. There's an old saying, familiarity breeds contempt. But that's only with contemptible people. With God, familiarity breeds greater love. And greater love for God will open up and expand our lives. Stephen Charnock, he was a Puritan uh, scholar who lived in the 16th century. And he said this, uh, an insightful statement. He says, our problems in life can be traced to a failure to internalize the attributes of God. In other words, when we worry, we fail to internalize God's wisdom. When we covet, for instance, we fail to internalize God's goodness. When we criticize, we fail to internalize God's gentleness. And the Apostle Paul moves on to remind us that when we know God, we'll fully become aware of three very significant truths. And I'd like to share them with you. The first truth is that we'll become aware of our hope. Again, Paul says, I pray that your eyes, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. And God's calling refers to what we would call the effectual call of God's people. And the effectual call of God happened in eternity past. In other words, God set his love upon us long, long before we even existed. And then that call becomes effective in time and space when we bow a knee and trust Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord. Uh, there's hope that accompanies God's call. And this hope would be liberation from guilt and the power to live well. It will also cultivate deep friendships that cut across barriers of race and class. Now, our hope after earthly life is the, internal, or is the eternal inheritance that we have in heaven. And when this body of sin is gone, when it's all stripped away, the beauty of Christ's reflections in us and his perfections in us will explode in glory. Now let me summarize what hope is. Hope is really a combination of belief plus desire. If you have belief without desire, you have, you have dread. If you have desire without belief, you have frustration. But if you have belief with desire, then you have the kind of hope that Paul is talking about in our text today. Now there's a second truth uh, that uh, we'll become aware of our value. Uh, I want you to know, Paul says, I want you to know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. In other words, what Paul is trying to say is that we are God's inheritance. And in verse 14, it says that we're God's own possession. And the word possession means portion. And one's portion is wealth. In other words, Deuteronomy says that the Lord's portion is his people, and that's significant. That means that the Lord, when he looks at you, feels wealthy. And there's a measure of irony in that. You know, God determines his wealth in terms of people. We all too often normally determine our wealth in terms of stuff. We look at the paintings on the wall uh, more than the person in the room. We tend to ensure things that are going to perish, and we tend to ignore the people that will remain. You know, one of the 
features of our children's and youth ministry here at Harvest Church is that our children and our youth are treated by the leaders, uh, the pastors, the sponsors as having infinite value. In other words, our youth and our children have to recognize that they are trophies of God's grace and God's love, just as we are learning it as adults. Isaiah chapter 49 lets us know that our names are actually inscribed on the hand of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the word described actually means chiseled. And when the reality of that kind of love drops from our head to our hearts, we no longer need to go through life looking for strokes. We can continue to encourage because our hearts and our souls are filled up by the depth of our Lord's love for us. You know, some reject Christianity uh, because they feel it's too narrow, it's too confining. It makes you feel too bad about yourself. In reality, God's love is so lofty and so out of control that we can't even begin to comprehend it. And to even read what the Bible says about it uh, blows our mind, but it, the words itself cannot begin to describe the love that our eternal God has for us. You know, in one respect, we are God's inheritance. In another respect, God is our glorious inheritance. Uh, the operative word here is the word glorious. And the word glorious means it lasts. It's not time bound. And that's why, you know, our mission statement as a church to glorify the Lord and all that the Lord loves is so eternal. Uh, love and wisdom and beauty are virtues that last because they reflect the character of God. Their counterparts, hostility, and foolishness, and chaos, they're temporal, and they're ultimately going to be no more when the Lord comes again. Now, our experience validates this. You know, when we're hateful, when we're selfish, uh, when we're uh, just concentrating on ourselves, we feel so temporal. Uh, we feel that life at times doesn't matter. But when we taste the friendship that we feel in God, uh, we, we realize that it's for eternity and that life really does matter. You know, the Bible always speaks of our inheritance in relational terms. You know, the word eschatology uh, refers to that which is going to happen in the future. And the Bible, uh, and excuse me, and we live in light of that which will transcend time. And when we do that, we will have an eschatological center of gravity. And that will give us eternal purpose with respect to how we live now. You know, the third truth is that we'll become more and more aware of God's power in our lives and in this world. You know, he says, Paul prays, I pray that you will know the surpassing greatness of God's power. Now, the power of God is the death-breaking might that he raised Jesus from the dead. And when physical death occurs, the chemical structure that holds us together and makes us an entity is broken down into its constituent parts and we no longer cohere. You see, for some, dying is the last act in the progression toward eternal death. For others, death is the last stage in the destruction of death. You see, in Christ, as soon as death crushes you, it recreates you. God is at work, even now, refining you from enslavement to the world order. 
He's breaking down pride. He's catapulting you from the mundane to the meaningful. He restores marriages. He changes communities. God's power is not de just death breaking. It's also dominion producing. God put all things in subjection under his feet. You know, the dominion of Christ is seen in the doctrine of what we can refer to as theologians, common grace. You see, saving grace is the benevolence that God pours out on his chosen. Common grace is the benevolence of God poured out on everyone. You see, God restrains evil and he gives the blessings of love and friendship and talent to everybody. You know, Johann Sebastian Bach was a Christian, a wonderful human being, and a brilliant composer, one of my favorites. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was not a Christian. He was not such a wonderful man, and he was a brilliant composer, and I love what he does. The compositions of both are simply divine gifts benevolently bestowed to make the world a more beautiful place. You see, the unbelieving but moral elected official who leads well is a gift from God. The photography of an Ansel Adams is a gift from God. The sharp breaking curveball of a Clayton Kershaw is a gift from God. You see, if God only gave the world beauty and insight through Christians, then there wouldn't be enough beauty. There wouldn't be enough insight. So what God has done is he's poured out gifts like a bucket of jewels on the entire human race in order to give us a world that's not just livable, but beautiful and wonderful during our time here. Common grace keeps Christians from being condescending. It cultivates respect for the gifts and the strengths of all people. The common grace of God is really the basis of his present dominion. And you ask the question, well, if what we're experiencing here on earth is the dominance of God, then how in the world do you account for all the troubles, all the strife, all the disasters? And I uh, have thought about that and pondered that. If God's in control, why all the calamity? And I don't have an adequate, an adequate answer for that but I do appreciate the words of a 17th century Puritan named John Flavel. And he said this, let God work out all his plans, have patience until the end, and then find fault if you can. You know, if we had the power to change things, to, to even all of the bad stuff like divorce and abuse and disease. As human beings, fallen human beings, we would end up screwing it up. We must trust the providential decree and grace of God. You know, God's work of grace in the world is for his glory and for our growth. Now, with respect to our growth, to know God, is to love God. And to love God is to trust his providential will for this world and specifically for our lives. Scripturally, belief and love are always organically linked. They can't be separated. You know, I, I read a story uh, some time ago. I don't know whether it was just an illustration or true or not, but uh, I found it interesting. Uh, there was a motorcyclist at the top of a lonely hill with a straightforward descent to down below. And as he was uh, going pretty fast, he saw two cars, one following the other at a fair distance apart. And he decided that he would adjust his speed so that he could uh, uh, go right between the two cars and go on his own way. What he failed to realize, however, when it was too late, is that the two cars were connected by a long wire. 
In other words, and I don't know again whether it was true or not, but nevertheless, what he tried to do was separate that which is connected to his own demise. You see, belief in God and love for the people of God cannot be separated. And that's what the Apostle Paul was reminding the church in Ephesus. He commends them on so much, but he reminds them uh, that as they follow the Lord, they grow in their love for one another. And um, it's the love that we have for one another that creates interest in the communities in which we live because they know that it's a supernatural thing. Will you bow with me in prayer? Our dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this insightful prayer. It's a prayer um, in which we can memorize and uh, be reminded of uh, periodically. It uh, lets us know just how valuable each and every human being is to you. It reminds us uh, that we're to be gentle and treat one another with extreme love and patience, that we don't uh, deride others, we don't uh, blow the hook, uh, put off our life and, and uh, yell and uh, manifest carnality. It's just a reminder to slow down, put God number one, to love our brethren, to encourage them along the way when they stumble, uh, to, uh, to incorporate the church in our own nuclear families so that uh, they get a broader understanding of where life is really at. And we thank you in the name of Christ. Amen.